Welcome into another episode of The Checklist, brought to you by Secure Mac. I'm Ken Ray. I'm Nicholas Raba. And I'm Nicholas Tachek. This week, we are talking to you. Specifically, we're answering your questions. You know that email we give out at the end of each show? Checklist at securemac.com. That really works. And to prove it, we're hitting five questions sent in by you or people just like you. Our five questions this week cover iCloud calendar spam, which I've been hearing a lot about like over the past few days, uh, anti-malware software for Macs, iCloud security, routers, switches, and modems, and finally, online banking. And let's just dive straight into the questions. Our, our first question today comes from uh, Nicholas P., which is actually one of you guys. Well, the first topic actually does hit uh, pretty close to home because both Nicholas Raba and myself encountered the uh, iCloud spam notification issue recently. Uh, We tweeted about it and had some listeners ask for more information on basically what's going on, how to get rid of those spam notifications, the whole deal. So basically what's been happening is there's a spam campaign that's been specifically targeting iCloud users uh, in a rather unique way, not the normal spam email that you know has the links and everything else. Uh, but the way they're doing it is causing spam notifications for various brand name clothes, accessories, sunglasses, whatever, to appear on iOS devices uh, as a calendar invite. They're taking advantage of a built-in feature in iOS that normally is really, really helpful. Uh, When an email comes in with a calendar invite, uh, iOS will automatically convert it to a push notification, uh, allowing you to quickly accept, decline, maybe, whatever, for the calendar event. Uh, Really useful 99% of the time. Obviously, in this situation, it's not quite so useful. (laughs) It would be less of an issue if you could simply delete those spammy invites from your calendar but you can't actually delete the invite without sending a reply to the spammer, which effectively lets them know that their spam got through to a real person and opening yourself up to more spam from them in the future. Uh, Another downside uh, to the normally helpful feature is that the original spam email that had the calendar invite is automatically deleted by iOS when it converts it to the in-app notification. So there's no way to go into your inbox, find the spam mail, and mark it as junk mail, uh, or otherwise block further messages from the spammer. So the end result is taking what would be normally a useful feature, uh, and it's leaving a lot of users scratching their heads as to why they're seeing the spam, where it's coming from, how to get rid of it. Uh, No clue how to stop them coming in. So there was an iOS developer named Aaron Douglas who comes to the rescue by figuring out a specific set of steps to take that will block this barrage of spam notifications from coming in. Uh, We'll include the link to his site uh, on the write-up for this episode, but we do have the steps available here as well. All you have to do is open iCloud.com in your favorite web browser and log in using the same account that you use on your phone for your calendar. Uh, Once you're logged in, click on Calendar, Click on the Settings Gear button in the lower left-hand corner of the screen. Click on Preferences, then click the Advanced tab, and you should see a section called Invitations. And there you'd want to change the option for Receive Event Notifications As to Email. Uh, The default is In-App Notification, and that is the one you do not want. So switch that to Email, and once you do that, all of the invites that you receive on your iCloud email account will come through as emails and not automatically be converted to those in-app notifications. So since they'll go to your inbox, you can then flag them as spam. They'll hopefully not show up in the future. Uh, Word on the street, I believe just the past couple days here, is that the problem seems to have abated. Uh, We don't know if this is the result of Apple doing something or if the spammers are laying low because of all this attention uh, the past few days. We're hoping that Apple took some much needed action here to solve the problem because all they would really need to do is adjust the spam filters on their iCloud email servers to be checking for these spammy calendar invites and just block them from ever reaching the devices of all these iOS users in the first place. Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, uh, Apple's mail notifications are are decent at figuring out what is spam email. It's kind of interesting that uh, the spam notifications are, are sort of slipping straight past that. I think, I believe what's happening here, I'm not positive on this, 
is that the spammers are only sending the calendar invite as the entire content of the email. So there's no other indication uh, to Apple's mail servers that it's spam. There's no email content to be checking against. It's just this calendar invite. Mm. And probably it was a, a, you know, an oversight on Apple's part that they weren't, I, I guess it's you know an oversight because who, who would ever think of doing that? Uh, apparently it's spammers, <laughs> but um, you know, now that they know how it's happening, they can probably figure out a way to stop it, hopefully. I could tell you right now, going on, 999 Ray-Ban and Oakley sunglasses and Cyber Monday NFL jersey, only $15. <laughs> you know, I didn't actually accept the calendar invite. Do they actually go to a site even? I didn't, I didn't check that much. Um, let's see. It shows the from name which doesn't look like a valid email address. And then the people who it was sent to was a whole bunch of variations of my email address at iCloud.com. Um, in the URL, it does list uh, a domain name and the note as well. But like you said, when you try to click away from it or delete the event, a window pops up. If you delete this event, an organizer will be notified you decline the event. Well, I don't want the organizer knowing. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to get more of these events or spams. Yeah. It's, uh, I will say, as we record this, and certainly, you know, as you say, Apple hopefully is on it, and maybe this won't even be an issue by the time people hear about it. But as we record this, I had a friend ask me about it just earlier today. So, I mean, maybe it's happening in waves, or maybe it's possible that they declined the invite the first time. Which, as you say, you know, let the spammers know, hey, there's actually somebody live at the other end of this. Uh, I'm going to spam away. I want to say really quickly, those steps earlier went by fairly fast. Nicholas did say that they are going to be available on the site. And I'll remind you, the site for this show is securemac.com slash checklist. So I will be giving that again at the end of the show. But if you wanted to, uh, if you wanted to check out those steps now, uh, securemac.com slash checklist. Are we ready for the next question, gentlemen? I believe we are. Okay. Doug H. wrote in with the following question. I had heard that anti-malware is not needed for Macs. Now, you see, there's more to this question, but we could stop right there, right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but we'll go ahead and read the rest of it anyway. Uh, I had heard that anti-malware is not needed for Macs. For instance, one blogger who is seemingly knowledgeable wrote, Beyond X-Protect, Gatekeeper, and MRT, there's no evidence of any benefit for other automated protection against malware. Uh, this was written a few years back, and I wanted to get your take on it. But after visiting your site, I sense that you do not agree since one of your products is MaxScan. Uh, what benefits are provided by MaxScan uh, beyond the built-in Apple protections? Well, we could and probably should spend an entire episode going over the common myths and misconceptions when it comes to the need for anti-malware software on a Mac. Uh, for today, we'll kind of briefly stick with the basics and cover them real quick. Uh, First and foremost, Apple's built-in protections are limited. Uh, by themselves, they won't stop you from getting infected. Uh, adware right now is the number one problem encountered by Mac users who have some sort of bad thing going on with their computer. Um, it's often installed by tagging along with other software, but almost all of it is signed with a valid developer ID certificate from Apple. So Gatekeeper is no help in blocking it um, until Apple becomes aware of the rogue software, revokes their certificate, Yada, yada. Uh, we have informed Apple actually on a number of occasions uh, about pieces of malware that they weren't aware of. And subsequently, they block the certificate and stops the user till they buy a new certificate, which at $100 a pop, it's not, not very hard to stop them there. So um, that's, that's one kind of shortcoming of Apple's built-in protections. Um, when it comes to you know, removing malware... If you're a power user and you're comfortable digging into the guts of the system and using terminal commands, yeah, you might not need anti-malware. Um, there are forums filled with steps to remove the various malware adware infections, but there are some problems there. Uh, the first is that oftentimes you won't just see one variant of a piece of malware. The malware authors will tweak it and add new features trying to evade antivirus or Apple or whoever. Uh, so the original removal instructions might not actually apply in every single case. So you might be missing components. The malware might come back, stick around. And if you mistype one of those terminal commands or you know, 
have the wrong um, file path, it's really easy to cause real problems with your Mac uh, by accident when you're trying to fix a problem. So if you're a normal home user, anti-malware is definitely something we would recommend. Um, we do offer an anti-malware product, MacScan 3, uh, which is designed to complement the built-in security features of your Mac. It does offer a variety of features that do go above and beyond those found in XProtect, Gatekeeper, and the other built-in protection that Apple offers, uh, including scan scheduling, automatic tracking cookie cleaning, detailed scan logs, automated malware definition and tracking cookie blacklist updates, web file cleaning, and a lot more. Uh, and if you want, you can learn more about MacScan 3 on our website at securemac.com slash MacScan. One of the things, and this is not to, well, I was going to say this is not to pump you up, but this is to pump you guys up. How you guys and I met a million years ago, and I guess it was really only half a million years ago, was there was some threat that came out and, and you guys just uh, put out a, a detection tool, but then also a removal tool. And I got to say, I mean... We're 13 episodes in, and this is the first time that you guys have actually talked about uh, uh, the products that you have. And so, I don't know. I I I, I want to I, w- I want to sing your praises briefly. I mean, not only do you know what it is that you're talking about, but you're not. I mean, you're not you're not scamming. You're not trying fear mongering. You're not telling everybody they have to have all the stuff that you sell, or else. Um, you're actually just out, kind of you know, like helping people get. Yeah, more secure, more comfortable, more familiar. And yeah, you have this product as well. And I'm not, I don't know. Obviously, I didn't plan to say anything about that because I'm not saying it very well. But it's, it, that's always been something that I appreciate about you guys. So, um, so, so, so there's that. And, and let's move on to the next question and, and past uh, my awkwardness. What do you say? <laughs> well, thank you for that, Ken, though. That was really nice. <laughs> uh, no problem. No problem. But please. We do appreciate that. No, we, we do. We want to, First and foremost, we do want to make sure that users have the knowledge to protect themselves. Uh, you know, obviously, we offer some tools that can help um, in situations where um, an infection does happen, despite knowledge of protections. But um, you know, first and foremost, making sure everybody knows the threats that are out there and how to avoid them or fix them is definitely kind of what we're all about. Our next question comes to us from Steve D. He wrote in to say, now that Apple has offered us the ability to store all of our documents and desktop on iCloud, enabling access from all of our devices, uh, I think it would be useful to discuss its security. In particular, how is Apple protecting our data? Are the files encrypted? Well, while the exact data protection mechanisms for iCloud used to be a bit of a black box per se, Apple has thankfully opened up quite a bit in the recent years and actually publishes a page on their site detailing the different security measures they've implemented for each category and data stored in the iCloud. Um, and that link we'll post in, in our write-up for this episode as well. Um, but here's a quick overall breakdown. Everything is encrypted in transit. As it's being sent from your Mac or iOS device to Apple's iCloud server or vice versa. Almost everything is encrypted at rest on Apple's iCloud servers. Calendars, contacts, bookmarks, notes, reminders, photos, documents in the cloud, iCloud Drive, backup, find my iPhone, and find my friends are all encrypted with a minimum of 128-bit AES encryption. Server-side encryption for notes is only available when iOS 9 or later or El Capitan is being used. iCloud Keychain uses 256-bit AES encryption to store and transmit passwords and credit card information. It uses, Nick, you got to say this. All right. Elliptic curve asymmetric cryptography and key wrapping. That is definitely a mouthful. <laughs> iCloud.com and back to my Mac sessions are encrypted with SSL, as is all the traffic between your devices and iCloud mail. However, consistent with standard industry practices, iCloud does not encrypt data stored in IMAP mail servers. And finally... I'm sorry, hold on. Can you explain that one? iCloud does not encrypt data stored on IMAP mail servers. Most people think of email as kind of being secure, but 
really it's only your kind of login and connection to your mail provider that's uh, going to be secure. Some services provide encryption of your mail in transit, but a lot of times it's kind of like sending a postcard through the mail. You know, everybody can see mm. who it's going. You know, if a postman along the way took out the mail, they could see on the postcard who it's addressed to, what the text is, and who it's from. That's how email works. Um, so industry standards are emails are stored that way on the server uh, if, if Apple's holding on to them. So um, they do offer some options for encryption built into the mail clients, kind of beyond the scope of this particular episode. Uh, definitely something we can cover in the future. But yeah, email is not as secure as people think. And I'm sorry, Nick, I, you, had, you had one more item on the list that I interrupted you. Yep, one more. And this is one of the most important ones to remember, is that your purchased music files from iTunes in the cloud, it's not encrypted on the server because it doesn't include any personal information, but everybody's going to know what you're listening to. <laughs> <laughs> Can I tell you, honestly, that's one of the reasons I got off Spotify. The whole thing where you could share your playlist, and then one day I realized, wow, I'm sharing my playlist, and everybody knows what I'm listening to. And I'm not saying I was listening to anything terribly embarrassing. I'm just saying you can't find out anymore because I'm not there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we have another question. Uh, listener Corey A. wrote in to ask, what is the difference between a router, a switch, and a modem? Um, most people don't know, says Corey. And, and I'll be honest, I, I'm not sure I do. It's easy to get these three terms confused, especially since the hardware provided by most internet service providers or ISPs combine two or more of them into a single unit. A modem is a piece of hardware that sets up a connection to your ISP so you can access the internet. Anybody who started using the internet back in the early to mid 90s might remember the funky noises the oh man somebody make <laughs> somebody make the dial up noise for me that we need a soundboard you'll remember those noises um, in some of in some of the older movies while you're while you're watching the movie hackers you may you may hear it um, when they tried to connect to AOL or eWorld CompuServe or Prodigy um, Back then, modems used to use your telephone line, and if anybody picked up the phone while you were connected online, chances are you'd be disconnected shortly after. These days, most modems connect over uh, higher speed connections, uh, cable or DSL, which provides a much faster connection speed. A router is a piece of hardware that routes traffic between various devices on your home network. It's the thing that keeps track of which piece of data goes to which device. So you could read news on your Mac while another family member catches up with friends on Facebook on their phone. When you connect to your home Wi-Fi network, you're connected to your router. Most of the time, your ISP will supply a single piece of hardware that acts both as a modem and a router these days. And a switch is commonly found in larger networks, such as educational institutes or corporations, uh, businesses. Switches provide more fine-grained control as far as data filtering and traffic control goes, and often include advanced security features and load balancing functionality, um, things that help control the network better. Normally not found, uh, you know, in your home network, um, and, unless you're a huge geek. I think some of our, our friends have uh, switches at home. <laughs> <laughs> we have uh, one more question for today. Uh, Robert M. wants to know a bit more about online banking. Uh, he actually says, how about devoting an entire episode to online banking? Uh, his bank uses finance works from Intuit. Um, then there are other web-based banking sites like Mint, which is also from Intuit. And then he wants to know still about the various banking apps uh, that reside locally, uh, say, built specifically for a Mac. Well, uh, yeah, it's, it's kind of hard to offer specific advice about a specific uh, service or app here, but we can kind of go over some, some best practices. Uh, Quicken is the one I was most familiar with. Uh, it reigned supreme for decades, maybe, um, as a de facto standard when it came to personal financial management. Uh, but more and more options have become available in the past few years, uh, including 
web services like those described in the question, um, apps on the Mac. Uh, basically, whichever one you choose is really a matter of personal preference. Uh, but going with one that is supported by your bank will generally make life a lot easier because you're kind of guaranteed that you know, everything's going to upload correctly and download correctly and reports will work. Uh, so that would probably be the best route to go. Um, some other best practices would be obviously making sure your computer is up to date with the latest operating system security patches, making sure your browser is up to date with the latest uh, version patches, running up to date anti malware software, you know, those things that we kind of always hammer home. Um, when you're picking uh, the software you want to use, you know, use well known commercial personal financial management software uh, or, or well reviewed, you know, independent. I know there's a few good ones out there. Uh, Basically, what you want to be doing is making sure that your data is encrypted both on your computer and while it's being you know, transmitted to your bank and back for, back to your computer from your bank servers. Um, you never want to be storing sensitive information such as your bank account number, social security number, credit card number, any of those things. You don't want to store them in an unencrypted format. So you know, no plain text files, no uh, you know unencrypted uh, spreadsheets. Basically, you want to make sure that whatever service or app you're using is going to be storing your data securely because it obviously could cause a lot of problems if it gets out. Uh, obviously, you'll only want to be using a secure network connection when you're doing online banking. So no banking from public Wi-Fi at Starbucks, you know, the airport, wherever. Use your phone's connection uh, tethered to your laptop if need be or your home Wi-Fi uh, just make sure it's a secure network. And I think our favorite point that we make on this show, uh, keeping backups, <laughs> you know, recurring theme, uh, keep backups of your financial data files. In this case, we're kind of going to expand our, our basic tip a bit. Um, it's okay to still keep them on an external hard drive. Uh, you might want to burn them to a CD or DVD if you still have a Mac that has that capability, uh, or physical printouts even if you know necessary. Uh, as far as storing the backups, though, it needs to be a secure location. So either a safe deposit box at your bank or a high-rated fire safe at home, basically making sure that that data is going to be protected from uh, you know, theft as well as, as stuff like fire or, or um, water damage, stuff like that. Uh, never store your financial data on a USB thumb drive, though. It's way too easy to lose or misplace one of those, you know, it falls out of your pocket on your way to the bank. Um, <laughs> I hope your data is encrypted on that drive, but uh, you know, it's that's that's. I mean, really, they're they're really useful um, devices to transfer data, but it's it's too too dangerous to use them for something as sensitive as your financial stuff. So stick to um, another method for for your backups there. Well, I said at the beginning of this episode that the email actually works. And there's five questions to prove it. Uh, I, I sang the praises of these guys halfway through the show. I will say they actually answer a lot of emails that uh, tend to be fairly granular, things that maybe wouldn't be applicable to a, to a, to a great big audience, uh, but, but are sort of specific uh, uh, Q&A. So a lot of people already knew that this email address worked. But I actually sort of enjoyed doing the Q&A show. So, so hopefully uh, we'll get more questions in and we'll be able to turn another one of those around for you. Uh, the email address again is checklist at securemac.com. Checklist at securemac.com. And we did mention uh, a few things that are going to be posted on the website earlier. That website again is securemac.com slash checklist. And if you can't remember that, remember this. You're listening to The Checklist by Secure Mac. And we'll talk to you next week. 